Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the latest 11 Minutes webcast from Acrobatic. We're a Carnegie Mellon University company that partners with educators so that together we can all improve, work to improve the entire landscape of online education. My name is Hal Turner, and I'm the Director of Customer Support here at Acrobatic. Today, I'm going to talk with higher ed expert Dr. Keith Hampson about some factors that are reconfiguring the role and the status of instructional content in online higher education. If you have any questions for him during the talk, please post them in the questions field, and we'll get to them as they come in. At the end of the talk, we're going to provide you with some information on contacting Dr. Hampson with a download link for the recording and for some uh, related resources and ways to join the online discussion on online instructional content. So, Keith, thanks so much for being here. I'd like to, for you to share some of your thoughts about instructional content in online higher education with us today, but I guess we should start with uh, some context. Uh, instructional content. What do you mean exactly by instructional content? Great question, because the terminology is not yet clear. I'm referring to any and all materials offered to the student to help them learn. So it's text, illustrations, audio, animation, video, and so forth. But it's also the activities that we design for the student to work through, either alone or with other students. How would you characterize the current state of instructional content? Well, in a word, disappointing. Uh, we, uh, unlike you, Hal, I'm old enough to remember the early days of online higher ed and, and when I was faculty. And, and we hoped, and I think we expected at that time, that higher ed would be able to take full advantage of this new medium. And we, we'd use it more than simply as a delivery system for yesterday's instructional materials. We'd leverage its uh, capacity to merge um, media, different media, leverage its interactivity, leverage its uh, ability to track our interactions. We'd make sure that the design of these courses was based on the best and the science of learning. And we'd use technology to test its quality and measure student progress. And though the technology was, was quite crude at that time, we fully expected that we'd move towards this state quite quickly, you know, given the importance of, of education. But 15 or 16 years later, uh, we see a startling number of, of online courses um, still being produced with uh, limited resources by people without sufficient time or incentives or the right skill sets. They're often patched together often quickly from a variety of sources and the whole process for instructors is is often difficult labor intensive uh, they don't have the the time the incentives the support that they need and then they ultimately end up using a lot of print uh, digitized print materials the materials from the classroom and uh, we, we we need to move beyond this state that's essentially my argument why then, even after 15 years, would you venture that content has been ignored? Why is it still in the state that you describe? Sure, there are a few reasons. Uh, the first that I'd point to is the organization itself, specifically the, the roles and responsibilities involved in the development of instructional content within most colleges and universities. By and large, it's still organized around the, you know, according to the, the classroom model, uh, in which the the burden of responsibility for course design and development falls to the individual instructor. Now, we've known for a very long time that this is not the ideal organizational model for designing high-quality instructional content. High-quality content introduces a whole new set of of challenges and requirements that simply can't be dumped on individual instructors on top of their existing responsibilities. Well, what about the service departments that most schools now include with titles like education and technology support services and the like? Don't they operate in a team format? Yeah, it's true. The, the most institutions have set up these service departments to support the move to online. But if you look closely, you'll see that these services have not changed the fundamental roles and responsibilities within the institution. And they they really weren't meant to. In most cases, these institutions that are there on an as-needed basis, uh, basis uh, at the discretion of the instructor. Uh, the traditional model in which the, the academic is saddled with the responsibility for the course remains more or less intact. Is money an issue? Can we afford better quality content? 
the question of what we can afford um, is interesting. And again, it, it's based on that figure is based on the classroom model. And in this model, we can only invest um, in course development as much as we're able to recoup from, and this is not the math that we do, but this is how it works here, recoup from a single offering a single course at a single institution for a few semesters until it needs to be redeveloped or it's replaced. And this places a serious limit on how much can be spent on course development, and it's often far less than what's required in order to really take advantage of the medium. Then, Keith, do you think we need to share content between institutions to make this work, to make it affordable? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, Sharing drives down costs, and it ensures that we can spend what it is that we need to spend in order to take full advantage of the medium. But this is where it gets interesting. It, it, this, in turn, means that some of the instructional content will come from other sources, from outside of the institution. But because of the way that our institutions and the people that work within them are rewarded, it doesn't always appear to them uh, to be in their interest or logical, if you will, for, their, for them to rely heavily on course content, instructional content from other sources, because they're paid to be subject matter experts. And this often translates into a perspective that they have to be the source of a great deal of instructional content that they prevent, present to their students. And this logic. It, you know, it stems from the research function uh, and responsibilities of faculty in the institution where research has to be original in some respects in order for it to be of value. Uh, but you know, it's, it's kind of a big topic and we can address that later. But by and large, I think we all need to move towards a situation where we're seeking out the very best available instructional content re regardless of its origins. Well, you've spoken before about how changing conditions are probably going to increase the attention that gets paid to content. Uh, can you expand on this? Yeah, there are a whole host of factors emerging more or less at the same time that are making people more uh, attuned to the possibilities uh, and the importance of instructional content. Um, we, one of them, one of the big ones, is uh, the call for greater accountability in higher ed most of which is focused on the quality of teaching and learning. You know, North American institutions continue to lead in terms of uh, reset, research productivity, but people are looking increasingly at things like low retention rates at certain types of institutions. And uh, there's a great desire, particularly from uh, government, to increase the percentage of people that have completed college education. And this pressure, whether it takes the form of performance-based funding or more detailed and, and public rating systems for colleges, is encouraging institutions to look at, well, frankly, anything that can enhance student success. And that, I think, is going to include uh, the quality of instructional content. Well, what about the role of data, the role of improved measurement of learning? Does this have any impact on instructional content in your view? No, data is absolutely uh, essential to instructional content. In fact, I think it's, in, it's fundamental to a number of um, advances and innovations in, in higher education generally. The, the ability to uh, accurately read a student's current level of understanding their proficiency on a, on a specific um, the challenge is key to all sorts of uh, advances in, in digital higher ed. But let me answer your, your question more directly. I see learner analytics influencing instructional content in two basic ways. One, and this might sound backward, but I'm sure you'll get it. In order to generate good data on the student's learning state, you need a well-designed course. So the more we move toward measuring learning, the more rigorous and thoughtful will be the course design. And the second way is maybe a little bit more straightforward. Once we start measuring learning, we'll begin to see new ways to change and improve the design of our courses, including instructional content. So the more information, the more insight into the impact of what it is that we're doing in our courses, 
the more innovations we're going to see. Right now, educators are working with far too little information and sometimes inaccurate information about the state of the learner. And once we get more accurate information in the hands of the educator, they're going to pr produce all sorts of innovations uh, in terms of instructional content, but in terms of course design in general. What other factors would you suggest are important? Well, another factor that's particularly important, um, although it's, it's probably the most abstract of all, um, Jesse Martin at Bangor University in Wales talks about this quite frequently, the, the idea that the overarching driver of change right now is in higher education um, is the fact that we're shifting from a scarcity of information to an abundance of information. And the reason that this matters is that when we think about the origins and the fundamental value of the institution back when it was first developed, and I argue still to a large extent now, is based on the idea that this information held within the institution was otherwise unavailable. You, the student, had to come to the university to get it. It couldn't be found elsewhere. So broadly, any change to this condition will have significant impact on the institution. It will force the institution to find new ways uh, to increase the value that it can provide uh, because this information is, is in knowledge is available elsewhere. So we need to recognize that the that how we educate is just as important as what we know, if you will, uh, what knowledge we hold. And I think improving the instructional quality of digital content is part of this shift. It's a natural and inevitable response to um, to an abundance of information. I almost hate to bring the topic up, but what do you think about MOOCs? Well, there's there's absolutely a connection between instructional content and MOOCs. One of the unintended consequences of MOOCs is that it it brings an unprecedented level of transparency to higher education. Typically, teaching and learning goes on behind doors. Um, within higher education. It was a couple of weeks ago, Stephen Mintz, the University of Texas system, he was at a conference and he argued that we need to deprivatize his words, teaching and learning. And I love the, the use of that word. And I think he's exactly right. Um, and what's interesting here is that MOOCs make what was once private, teaching and learning, very public as a result of the extraordinary attention that they re received over the last 18, 24 months. And the focus of this attention is predominantly instructional content. I think this is, again, largely accidental. The instructional content in MOOCs is serving as a marker of instructional and institutional quality in this particular context. And, of course, university leadership recognized this some faster than others, and they've responded by increasing the quality of the instructional content and by increasing the production value of that instructional content, the lighting and sound and quality and so forth. So while the, the motivation for this attention being paid to instructional quality in MOOCs may not be ideal, it's often driven by competition and reputation, it nevertheless puts instructional content, for the first time, I would say, front and center. And therefore, it will very likely drive improvement across the system as a whole. Anything else? Sure. Well, there are a number of other factors. We haven't mentioned uh, consumerization of IT, uh, growing expectations of students, uh, the participation of media companies in education, which is quite interesting. But the larger story is that th these conditions are coming together uh, more or less at the same time. And they're drawing attention to the importance of the possibilities for better instructional content in online courses. Uh, I think it's time that we explore these possibilities. Let's test them, see uh, how they work, where they work best. It, it's overdue. Thanks for sharing your insights, Keith. Now that we've touched on some of the ways the instructional content models are shifting, we can start together working to affect positive change. Visit the URL here for a recording of today's webcast and for more information and resources connected with Keith's talk, including social media discussions. The webpage address will also be sent in a follow-up email to today's attendees. You can learn more about Acrobatic on our website, acrobatic.com. Don't forget, Acrobatic ends with a Q. 
also find us at facebook.com slash acrobatic or twitter.com slash acrobatic. We really appreciate your spending this time with us today. Thank you so much for listening. Take care.